Okay, so Watches and Movies Part 2. This time we're going to look at the 1997 action thriller The Edge, starring Alec Baldwin and Sir Anthony Hopkins. to the Timeless Watch channel, guys. Before I do anything, what am I wearing? I am wearing a strap. No, I'm wearing a watch. The wrong way around, upside down. As a nod to all our protagonists in this series, or most of them, John Wick, John McClane, and even Alec Baldwin in, uh, in this movie I'm talking about. Of course, this is the uh, Seiko Alpinist. And it kind of sits nicely upside down, I have to say. For some reason, I kind of like it that way. It's a slightly small watch for my wrist. And for some reason, upside down, it kind of, it fits somehow, if that makes any sense. Anyway, uh, I had asked you guys in the previous video why you guys thought that a lot of these uh, protagonists, uh, heroes in movies, uh, were wearing their watches upside down. I think unanimously, or almost unanimously, most of you agreed, uh, and I thank you for those comments, that it was a kind of a military thing, that uh, if you have the watch up right, that the crystal might reflect sunlight and, you know, give away your position from a distance. And also another thing that I never even thought of, if you're holding a, a rifle like this and staring down at sights, the time's looking right at you. You know, if you have to watch the time, you can just look down and look up at your sights. It's all right there in front of you. I never even thought about that. So thanks for enlightening me, guys. There was another one as well that also made sense to me that um, if there's a watch in the frame, that it could be a nightmare for editors that, you know, these actors, they have to do scene over and over and over again, they have to say their lines, the same lines over and, you know, as the director says, okay, let's try it a different way, or there was a problem, or let's do another take. Some directors do lots and lots of takes. So uh, I guess as the takes go on, time goes by. So <laughs> that must be a nightmare for an editor if they want to use a different line. You know, line three was better in take six, and line four was better in take two, or something like that that you would see the watch uh, give away the time, like maybe even the, the whole crew go to lunch or something, come back and then try some more takes. And by then it's like a completely different error on the, on the watch. They would have to go in and reset the watch for every take. So that could be a nightmare. It just makes it so much easier to turn the watch around. Uh, thanks for all that input. Let's get on to this movie. It's a very simple moral story about a wealthy man. Um, Charles Morse is a billionaire intellectual played by Sir Anthony Hopkins, of course. And he has a very young and beautiful wife, Mickey, played by Elle McPherson. They have just arrived in the kind of wide panoramic Alaskan wilderness on their private jet. They are gonna take a smaller flight then to a remote location for a photo shoot. Mickey, played by El McPherson, is a model, and uh, Bob Green, played by Alec Baldwin, is the head photographer with his uh, assistant, Stephen. Now, the story is written by David Mamet, who's a very, very famous writer, playwright. Mamet is well known for using a particular writing technique known as foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is when you put in a small mention of something that might happen later in the story just to kind of plant the seed in the audience's mind. I would advise you to fly under any low ceiling, any possibility of bird strike or ice. What's bird strike? Flocks of migrating birds. If we hit them, we're all dead. That's foreshadowing. The, that, in fact, actually does happen later. Though it comes as somewhat of a shock to us, it's not a complete surprise. We have been slightly warned about it already. Now, as it happens, our billionaire intellectual is a little bit preoccupied about who's looking at his young wife. Man, what wouldn't I do to get my hands on her? Get your hands on who? 
And so already, as great writers do, we're being set up with a certain amount of foundation here for the story. Now, once we're on the smaller flight, we then get the mention of the watch. Hey, is that a new watch? Yeah. Dual time zone tells the time in two places. So if I'm in LA and I want to know the time in New York, I'd have to go through the anguish of adding three. <laughs> This is one of two watches that appear in the movie and they have a certain significance uh, and important role in the plot. Alec Baldwin's character, Bob, is indeed wearing the watch upside down. In fact, what he's wearing is a Seamaster chronograph. Of course, we don't actually see this dial until much, much later in the movie. Now, when they arrive at the next destination, we begin to get an idea of how intellectual and well-read Mr. Charles Morse is. He seems to be a very curious character who's interested in reading and general knowledge, and he seems to know a little bit about pretty much everything. I'm surprised you know what a bench rest is. Charles knows what everything is. You got a question to ask him. Charles knows everything. Take a mighty accomplished man to claim that. I didn't claim it, I don't claim anything quite an astute man, an observant man. He keeps his ears and eyes open. And right now, of course, his eyes seem to be preoccupied by how his wife is behaving with the head photographer, Bob Green. I seem to retain all these facts, but uh, putting them to any useful purpose is another matter. Another curious detail is that he was given a book, uh, it seems by his secretary for his birthday, all about surviving in the wilderness and fighting bears, etc. Once again, more and more foreshadowing about what's to come later in the movie. That night, they actually throw a humble surprise birthday party for Charles, during which his wife, Mickey, gives him a beautiful Hamilton pocket watch with a special engravement. And the main photographer, Bob, gives him a pocket knife in a case. We don't know it yet, but these three items, Bob's watch, the pocket knife, and the watch that Charles' wife, Mickey, has gifted to him, are all major players in the story that's about to unfold. Now, when the photo shoot begins, Charles remains somewhat on the sidelines, reading his book about surviving in the wild. The whole time he's observing the behavior of his wife around Bob and becomes more and more suspicious. Then Bob has an idea to actually find a local hunter character that he wants to include in his photographs. So himself, his assistant Stephen and Charles all jump into the plane to head off to find that guy. Some of the scenery shot in this movie is truly spectacular. When they arrive at the hunter's home, they realize he's actually out hunting. And once again, more foreshadowing as we're introduced to the concept of a deadfall. What's a deadfall? It's a pit to catch bears. Extending their efforts, they get back into the aircraft to go seek out the hunter. And during that flight, Bob and Charles have a small but very curious confrontation. Well, all that money. Uh -huh. Never knowing who your friends are, never knowing what people value you for. Yeah. So, how are you planning to kill me? That moment of tension between our two main characters is cut dry by something we were warned about earlier. A flux of migrating birds hitting the plane. Pilots killed, but Charles, Bob, and Stephen do survive. And there begins our story of survival and wit. After they gather themselves and realize their predicament, Charles reaches for his new watch that his wife gave him in order to calculate his orientation. Point the hour hand at the sun, halfway between the hour hand and 12. Yourself. But alas, the beautiful gift has not survived the plane crash, at least not the mechanics anyway. This is broken. Give me a watch. Give me a watch. Mine's busted too. Bob barely glances at it and says that it's broken. A very curious move indeed. So now we get the idea that perhaps Bob isn't the most forthcoming of characters and may indeed have something to hide. There's a very poignant line in the narrative here, more foreshadowing nonetheless, where Charles describes how men die in the wild. I once read an interesting book. It said that uh, most people lost in the 
wilds, they, they die of shame. What? That line is repeated from time to time in the coming adventure as it proves very important to how our whole story unfolds. You see, they die of shame. What did I do wrong? How could I have gotten myself into this? And so they sit there and they die. As the story moves on, they find themselves fighting the elements in a struggle to make their way back towards somewhere where they may be found and rescued. Being clearly the most intelligent and knowledgeable, Charles naturally it? takes the lead. No. At a certain point, the awkward confrontation that came up in the aeroplane comes up once again as Bob and Charles poke each other's conscience and motive. Home. Money. Now it's the broad, now it's the boodle, and nothing is safe. But as it turns out, they all have a much larger problem waiting for them in the wilderness. A Kodiak bear. The following scenes are chases from the bear after our three survivors. When Bob actually saves Charles' life, Charles begins to have doubts about his previous suspicions and paranoia. He saved me. Get over it, Charles. I just need you to navigate. He saved my life. Surviving in the wilderness proves to be a test of character for all included, and Bob's wealth doesn't seem to have any value out here. After an accidental injury, Stephen lies in recovery, but alas, his blood has drawn the Kodiak bear closer. And in fact, Stephen meets a very gruesome and ugly fate. Now Charles and Bob realize the trouble they're really in and that they're gonna need a lot of courage, a lot of luck, and indeed each other's help to survive. I must say that in many modern films, Anthony Hopkins rarely uses his projecting loud voice. It's quite often that kind of haunting Hannibal Lecter tone. But in his earlier career, he had a very, very loud and prominent yell. And it only comes out in a few moments in this film. And when it does, it really is something to behold. What would you like to do? Huh? Should we lay down and die? Do you want to lie down and die, Bob? So the story now focuses down onto our two main characters by themselves, very different kinds of personalities, but depending on one another for their very survival. I think Alec Baldwin really stepped up to the plate here with a powerful and dynamic performance. After all, it's gonna be slightly intimidating to know that most of the scenes of the film will be just you and Sir Anthony Hopkins. Drink some golf, screw in the maid, but get you in an emergency. That's right. And you bloom. You make me sick, you know that? You make me sick! I'm sure I do. But I think he did a marvelous job batting the ball back in his direction. By now, our two lead men realize that they're being stalked by the Kodiak bear, and the only way is to fight their way out. Now we see our wealthy, educated man turn to his more primal, courageous Blood. instincts as he plans to kill the bear. Say, I'm gonna kill the bear! Say it! I'm gonna kill the bear. What one man can do, another can do! What one man can do, another can do. Say it again! What one man can do, another can do. Say it again! What one man can do, another can do. If it wasn't already clear enough by now, we see that Charles is indeed a true leader of men. And it comes as no real surprise that back at civilization, he's built himself quite a large fortune. A great struggle ensues and both are put to the ultimate test as they face this enormous predator. And using a technique he had learned about earlier in the book that his secretary gave him for his birthday, he manages to successfully slay the bear. It doesn't seem to matter whether he's in society or lost in the wilderness. Once again, Charles seems to manage to dominate his surroundings. The men now seem unstoppable and 100% in control of their destiny as they move forward in search for home.
Eventually they come across a faint sign of civilization, a small cabin with supplies and a boat. Realizing now that the remainder of their hike will be a lot easier and they are maybe almost home, Bob begins to have certain ideas once again. Searching for something to light the fire with, Charles opens the box of the penknife he was given by Bob just days earlier. A piece of paper falls out that Bob hadn't noticed was in there. The invoice reveals a request for three engravings. One is the special note from Mickey to her husband on the Hamilton watch. The second is an engraving on the penknife. But there's a third. The third request for an engraving is an intimate one from Mickey to Bob. He realizes that the pocket knife and the watch were purchased at the same place by the same person. Charles realizes that along with his own gift, Mickey had purchased the knife, given it to Bob to give to Charles, and also the beautiful new watch for Bob himself. She bought two watches, one for her husband and one for her lover. Now, after fighting the elements, incredible adversity, and even a large predator in the wild, Charles realizes that his true enemy, his real Kodiak bear, was by his side the whole time. With his worst fears realized and his heart breaking, Charles can barely move. We now realize why Bob was wearing the watch downward and why he wouldn't offer it up to be used. Can I see your watch, Bob? The watch was most likely not broken and was hiding the truth the whole time. My watch. Don't work. Told you. Busted. I know it's... I know it doesn't work. But could I see it? With the new supplies and the boat on the river, Bob no longer needs Charles to return to safety. And now his original plan resumes. What's the matter, Bob? Can't do it sober. Facing his last moments, Charles inquires about details. Come on, Charles. Gun is done. Sorry. It's time. Don't do it, Bob. You live in a dream world, Charles. You always have. But alas, well a thing we were warned about before. Charles, don't! Ah! Ah! Be careful of the deadfall. If there was ever a question about Charles' character, there shouldn't be now. He proceeds to save the man who was sleeping with his wife and had planned to kill him. In one of the final scenes of the film, we're shown the smallness of one character and the greatness of the other. Why would you want to save and filled with regret, Bob makes his apology to Charles. I'm sorry. I'm sorry what I did. Don't die on me, Bob. They're finally spotted by searchers. <laughs> but it's too late. And we finally see the face of the watch on the other side of Bob's wrist. Bob has indeed done what many men do in the wild. He died of shame. Charles returns a changed man, finally set free from the fear and paranoia he had earlier in the story. He confronts his wife and places the watch in her hands. And we finally get a good look at the watch itself. It's the Omega Seamaster Chronograph. Incidentally, Mickey is wearing an Omega Constellation. From this, Mickey realizes that Charles is aware of her terrible betrayal. But Charles is unfazed and has returned from the wild with his dignity and his spirit very much intact. We're all put to the test, but it never comes in the form or at the point we would prefer. How did they die, sir? They died saving my life. 
And there it is, guys. Can you believe that? She bought two watches and had them both engraved. Whew. Let's hope he had her sign a prenup. Uh, that's it, guys. I'll show you my reverse watch again. It's the Seiko Alpinist wearing it upside down. There's something cool about it. Like doing this whole movies, watches and movies thing. I'm kind of, I'm seeing a lot of watches, you know, the other way around, John Wick and so on. It's very cool. It's like a totally different way to enjoy a watch. If any of you guys want to try it out with one of your watches, take a photo of it and uh, stick it on Instagram and tag me at the Timeless Watch channel so I can take a look at it. Might be a fun little experiment for us to all like wear our watches upside down uh, just for a couple of days, just to shake it up a little bit. It's kind of cool. I don't know why. Anyway, uh, that is it guys. I hope you enjoyed that one. I think it's a great film. You should go watch it if you haven't seen it, even though you know the whole story. It's still worth it to see those two great actors kind of you know, bounce off one another. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to see that kind of mastery at work and obviously a great script and, you know, David Mamet's writing, it's amazing. And uh, once again, great to see when watches actually play a role in a movie, when they're actually a kind of a vital element of the plot. It's really a cool thing. And that's what this series is about. It's not just watch spotting. It's not just, hey, look at that watch, look at that watch. I could do that forever. There's always a watch in a movie, but it's not always the case when a watch actually plays a part in, in the story. So that's what all this is about. Next time I'm going to do a film by Christopher Nolan by the name of Interstellar. It's a much more recent movie with Matthew McConaughey. Uh, it's going to be a really difficult one for me to explain. I'm going to have to brush up on my astrophysics for it. But uh, as it happens, I'm a big fan of that kind of nerdy stuff anyway. So I, I should have fun doing it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And thanks once again for watching the Timeless Watch channel. I will see you in the next one.